Good morning and welcome this morning. This morning our call to worship will come from Psalm 33, verses 1 through 5. The psalmist writes, Shout to the Lord, O you righteous. Praise befits the upright. Give thanks to the Lord with the lyre. Make melody to him with a harp of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully on the strings with loud shouts. For the word of the Lord is upright, and all his work is done in faithfulness. He loves righteousness and justice, and the earth is full of the steadfast love of the Lord. Heavenly Father, strengthen us with endurance and perseverance, that we might be the witnesses to your steadfast love, the witnesses to your faithfulness in a world around us, that there is hope. Father, as we come to worship you this morning, let us come with thankful hearts to lift up your name and praise, recognizing that you are the source of our sustainment and the source of our hope. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let me invite you to stand. Let's sing our first uh, song, We Will Glorify. <laughs> one here this morning and uh, and those who are watching online it is good to have everyone here and, um, and to be a part as our crowd continues to, to grow a little bit in the live and in person and uh, and again let me thank you for being here just uh, as a, a thankfulness for the encouragement that it brings and uh, to have faces out there is a wonderful thing so thank you for doing that and uh, you know it is good to have dr. Jack Kim with us this morning helping lead in music it's always to have Jack Good to have Jack with us, and we're thankful and, uh, for him. Uh, with that, a couple of announcements. Uh, as we mentioned last week, and I'm sure you are probably tracking, the, uh, the online giving you know, is up and running and, and operational now, so we encourage you to use that. Let me and, uh, and look at that. Girls, there we are. And uh, in the, if you look on the Facebook page, the actual the, the URL is listed there. I will read it real quick. It, uh, but it's listed there if you go to you know webtrack.mwr.army.mil forward slash digital giving forward slash it'll take you there and uh, if you look in the announcements that uh, Kathy Kim has sent out the, the hyperlinks are in the announcements as well which is a lot easier than trying to remember what I just said to you but uh, but if you go to the website it is super easy you just follow the drop down menus there um, you'll go and find uh, the garrison or our, our Fort, Fort Leavenworth drop down the then you need another drop down menu to the different services and uh, the Protestant services, gospel services, Christ Fellowship, Catholic service, all those will, will drop down and uh, click on the Protestant service and, uh, and then go, it'll take you to the amount and go to the, the checkout for it and, uh, and you'll be able to do your, your giving online as well as we, the folks who are present uh, and are obviously able to drop off their offering in person and uh, we're certainly thankful for that and uh, and then of course you're uh, and, uh, still able to drop off in person you know up at frontier chapel during the week as well and, uh, and so I encourage you to participate and be a part of that and we're thankful that we're able to help make that opportunity available to you with that um, 
Thank you for your prayers for Vacation Bible School. They've had over 100 register and, uh, this week and participate in it, so that is exciting. And uh, hopefully we'll, we'll hear more later on as, as that has happened. But, um, but we are really thankful for all those who have registered and participated in it. And uh, again, thank you for your support in prayer and uh, of that. Uh, a, a plug for a couple things going on during the week. One, just a reminder, you know, as folks are coming into the community and learning the, the, the new battle rhythms and things that take place, um, Officer Christian Fellowship invites you on Tuesday mornings at 630 to participate in their Bible study. And uh, it's in Zoom. And, and again, online, you can go to our Facebook page, the, the, I say the, the Zoom rooms, but the locations are available there for that. And uh, so that's on Tuesday morning, our men's and uh, uh, Thursday morning uh, Bible study at 06 and uh, is listed there as well. And, and remind you, of course, for our Sunday school options, uh, starting at 945, directly following our service, there is a study in Luke and one in First Peter taking place. And I encourage you to be a part and uh, of those as well. And let me look in my list here and make sure I haven't skipped over anything. I think I have hit most of the announcements and uh, as they are taking place and happening there and, uh, and being a part of that. And, 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 yep. and, and also again, if you're watching online then you already know where our Facebook page is, but most of you have probably seen it. Remember most of the announcements there and the details as it gets exact in some of the digital opportunities are there so you can track those down and uh, and be aware of that again thank you so much and all for being a part i encourage you to continue to stay in touch and uh, with our service whether it be through email you know posting on the facebook and uh, or reaching out by phone and uh, stay in touch and let us know how we can serve you during these times and uh, and we'll continue to, to keep our community built even though in a virtual as well in person presence and, uh, and with that I will be quiet, invite you to stand as we continue in song and hymns for him. Our hymn of adoration is I am his and he is mine.
you come to our time of affirmation of faith and uh, remind you one of the uniquenesses as as creeds have been used uh, throughout the history of the church is a reminder of our connection to the church past present and future and uh, as we proclaim our beliefs and uh, and the foundations of our faith and with that i will ask you christian what do you believe i believe in god the father almighty maker of heaven and earth and in jesus christ his only son our lord who was conceived by the holy spirit born of the virgin mary suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into Hades, and the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. As we come to our, our time of pastoral prayer, and I'll continue to remind you to, to keep the, the needs of our, our family and, uh, and our, our congregation here at the, the 830 traditional service and your prayers, those who are, are healing and, and dealing with different sicknesses and illnesses. We are certainly thankful and uh, for those who are recovering and doing well, continue to keep them in our prayers. Uh, thankful for, again, the response to, to the Vacation Bible School and, uh, and celebrate that. Uh, a couple of, I say updates, a couple of really new things and uh, things taking place. And uh, one of our, our chaplains who is here for uh, CGSC, and, uh, Paul Talbert, uh, his father-in-law passed away and uh, they had traveled to Mobile, Alabama. And uh, the funeral will be tomorrow and uh, for Jim Dean, and uh, so keep their family and, uh, in your prayers and as well as they're going through a, a time of grief and uh, remember them. Uh, continue, uh, well, I'll say continue. I got a, a friend of mine, uh, Luis Ramirez, and uh, he is, I say, he got some struggles that he is going through. I ask you to keep them or him in your prayers. And uh, we'll mention uh, one of the unique things, and uh, as you if you've ever owned a horse or had one and realized how long they live and how attached you become to them, it can be difficult. And uh, one of the things he's struggling with, he lost his horse, Cactus, had uh, passed away this past week as well. And uh, so anyway, I ask you to continue to keep him in your prayers. Uh, a friend of mine, Laura, you know, is dealing with breast cancer. I ask you to keep her in your prayers. Uh, continue, as we talked about uh, Christ Fellowship, or not Christ Fellowship, uh, Officers Christian Fellowship, earlier, continue to keep uh, Jim Harbridge and his family in your prayers. As, uh, as they have family members, both he and his wife, who are dealing with COVID-19. And I say that as a reminder to keep all those who are impacted by that in, uh, in your prayers as well. And uh, again, as always, continue to keep our service members, and our men and women, as they are deployed and around the world in your prayers as they serve and uh, continue to keep our nation lifted up in our prayers and uh, as well. With that, let us go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, you are our maker and creator and our sustainer. You meet each and every need of our lives. You instructed us that in your teachings that the sparrows do not worry about what they will eat, the flowers do not worry about what they will wear, that they know their Heavenly Father has a plan to meet each and every need of their lives. So Father, as we come to you in prayer, let us remember that as we pray for each other. Lord, we may be praying for those who are in medical need, who may be recovering from cancer in their lives, and, uh, and that you continue to strengthen and heal their bodies in the midst of it. Father, there are those who are experiencing grief in their life, whether it's the loss of a loved one, the loss of, of someone who has been dear to them, and, uh, and again, maybe a, I say a particular pet or animal that has been a, a part of their life for a while. The grief is present and real. We are reminded you know, in Corinthians that you are the God of all comfort. And you are there in our lives in the midst of that. And as we recited in the Apostles' Creed of the resurrection, remind us, in our periods of grief for the loss of ones that we are separated from by death and now that in christ the resurrection reminds us that we one day will be united together father as we as a nation pray for each other 
and pray for the well-being. Father, we pray for your protection of our servicemen and women as they serve around the world. Watch over them and keep them safe. Again, as we've mentioned before, they live out the call of sacrifice daily. And we want to honor them by lifting them up in prayer, praying your hedge of protection around them. Father, we pray for our nation as well, as ones who are concerned about its well-being. Paul instructs Timothy to pray for the king that all may go well and that the church may be able to prosper under the midst of it. So, Father, we pray for our nation. You watch over it. Bring healing. Father, if there's a, a need for repentance, and, uh, as your word says, if your people who are called by your name will humble themselves, Father, Father make us aware of that. That we might be willing to humble ourselves. And call upon your name, again, recognizing you are the need of our life and the utmost critical need for all of eternity in our life. But to be willing to hear your voice and to come before you with faith and trusting in the midst of it. So, Father, we come and gather as a congregation and pray for each other. Lift each other up as a family. Lift our nation up as citizens of our nation. Being reminded also we are citizens of the kingdom of God, but being faithful to do what your word has instructed us and called us to do, that as a people of faith, these are the things that help concern our lives and, uh, and, and those around us in order for the gospel to be able to be proclaimed and to be able to be heard that brings hope and healing to a nation around us. So, Father, we come and lift our prayers up to you together. Father, thank you that prayer is not only an individual thing, but it is a corporate thing upon which we can unite together around it. And come and lift our prayers up to you and, uh, as a corporate body as well. And with that, we will gather around the Lord's Prayer as we pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, good morning once again. What a joy it is to see each of you here. And uh, as it's already been given, we welcome you, especially those of you who are joining us online. What a wonderful day that the Lord has given us. And uh, so excited about our text this morning as we begin looking at the great revival that took place in the heart of Nineveh. And so with that, I will ask if you would, if you would grab a copy of God's Word and turn with me in Jonah chapter 3. Jonah chapter 3, and we're going to read all 10 verses. Jonah chapter 3, all 10 verses. And I will ask if you will stand with me as we honor the reading of the word of the Lord together. Jonah chapter 3. Here's the word of the Lord. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days' journey in breadth. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey, and he called out, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth, from the greatest of them to the least of them. And the word reached the king of Nineveh, and he rose from his throne, removed his robe, and covered himself with sackcloth and ashes. He issued a proclamation and published through Nineveh, by the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth, and let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way, from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent, and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. And when God saw what they did and how they had turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. Please be seated. 
Well, what a wonderful journey it has been going through uh, the book of Jonah, and we are almost done, almost done, but certainly we are at a huge transition. Jonah, who has been running from God, is now obeying God. And last week, we, we talked about that renewal. We talked about the response, if you will, of the mercy of God. And really, our big idea was this, that the mercy of God, we experience it so many ways throughout our life, regularly at that. And that mercy of God ought to be that which causes us to praise God because of that which he has provided to us. And we saw the merciful wrath of God and how, how God is at work in Jonah's life, allowing him to come to that lowest of low to where he might then begin to look up and acknowledge God. And we talked about this missing note of Jonah's song, right? And that missing note was the idea really of repentance. Certainly there was a indication of repentance because he called out to God, but yet his heart was not fully addressed. There were some rooms that he held dear and he did not open them up. And primarily it was the understanding that God, the God of Israel is indeed the God of all the nations. And Jonah did not come to that understanding and did not repent. And that seemed to be that missing note of his song. Then we concluded talking about uh, the mysterious ways of which God brings his salvation. You know, the great fish was not a punishment for Jonah. Uh, it was the way that God saved him. And in that fish, God worked in his heart and brought him to that point to where he indeed called out for renewal. And so now we find after Nineveh or after Jonah has been vomited upon the land, not just spit out, but the scripture says vomited onto the land, how the word of God comes to him anew. And so what a joy it is for us to look at this. And before we do, I ask if you will join with me in a word of prayer. Father, as we come to you, we come to you, God, acknowledging that you are the Holy One, that you indeed are the sovereign God of the universe, and we are in need of you. We confess, God, that too often we lose sight of our sinfulness and your holiness. And God, as we look in this text and the work of grace that you bring about in Nineveh and even in Jonah's life. Help us, O oh God, to be reminded of what you have done for us. Break our hearts for the things that break your heart. Grant us a greater understanding of who we are before you and our need of you. God, that we indeed might be usable vessels for your glory and for your honor. And Lord, as we have opened up the bread of life, we pray, O oh God, that you would indeed speak to us for your glory and for your honor. And we ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Etau. Etau, in the language of the Mook people, means it is true. It is truth. It is also the name of a documentary about Mark and Gloria Zuck who traveled to Papua New Guinea and the work of grace in, in God and in, in their life as well as in the Mook people there in Papua New Guinea. It's really a fascinating story. Um, it is something that you can view on YouTube, so you can easily look up e -tau and and watch the story. It's roughly about 28 minutes. And there's also another video clip about uh, what happens afterwards. But Mark and Gloria, they, they go to minister to the Mook people in Papua New Guinea. 
And they are part of what's known as the New Tribes Mission. And they are teaching the Bible from its beginning. And they are highlighting the stories of God. And just imagine the, you know, the great stories of creation, uh, the stories about Abraham, about Joseph. And so they go through and they, they teach the Mook people these stories that we read about in the Old Testament. And then they come to the New Testament and they begin to introduce Jesus and who he is and his death on the cross and his resurrection. And then they go back to the stories of the Old Testament and begin to explain to them how all the stories that they had heard and come to admire and love point to Jesus. And in the process of this, as this day, as you watch this recording, Mark is explaining to them about how God is at work and what he has done through Jesus in this fulfillment. And you notice the moot people, very reserved people, one by one begin to stand up and declare that I believe, that I believe this is truth. Eta, Eta. One by one, they stand and give a testimony and conclude with Eta, Eta. And Mark, as he is noticing and after a little while says, if you believe this, if this is indeed Etau and you believe, then according to the word of God, your sins are forgiven. And in a moment that seemed to go on forever, but just in the moment of silence as that truth hit the hearts of the moot people, they began to jump and shout and praise for two and a half hours just with the realization that there is a God and they have found him and been found in forgiveness. What a glorious story of the work of God's grace coming to the Luke people and awakening them to the knowledge of the truth. But it is a story that almost did not take place. Mark had petitioned to work with another mission agency prior to New Tribes Mission, known now as uh, Ethnos 360. And he was told, having been 30 years old, that he needed to have a Bible education. And by the time he finished his four years of Bible education, he would be 34 years old and too old to learn a new language and therefore unfit to be a missionary. Yet God in his work of grace used one man, one family to bring an awakening, a knowledge of himself to the Mook people in Papua New Guinea that has even spread further. This is what we see in the Ninevites as well. This work of God's grace, just as he had worked here in the Mook people, he is working in the Ninevites, opening their eyes, granting them this understanding of him, of a pending judgment, of a knowledge of truth. And in our text today, we will see how they respond to that message. And as we look at this text, really what I want you to see and what I want you to understand is that we are but just one breath away. We, we are just one moment away from a new awakening from God. It is all about the work of God's grace and God is simply using vessels of mercy to bring forth that word and that work of grace. But as it is believed, hearts are transformed, families are transformed, villages are transformed, cities are transformed, and a newness of life begins. Certainly we see this in the life of the Ninevites and what I want you to focus on here this morning 
is that this work of God's grace can also be worked in our life and in our time if we would just respond to that work of grace in our own life as well. As we look at this text, what I want us to focus on in the time that we have are just these three truths of the work of God's grace in the life of the men of these. This work of God's grace that awakens us from our sinful slumber and breathes fresh life to us that we too might come to a knowledge of the truth, etau, and be moved and transformed. Three truths. First, I want you to see here that God's grace is carried by broken vessels. God's grace is carried by broken vessels. We see that in verses 1 to the first half of chapter, oh, I'm sorry, of verse 3. And so again, look at the text here with us. Again, the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, arise and go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. It's interesting, you probably have heard this phrase over and over again, but God, the one whom we serve, is a God of second chances. And what a glorious truth that is for us. And that should encourage and strengthen every one of us here today who fear the Lord. Because we all fail. We all fall short of being the men and women that God has called us to be. We all struggle with the call of God and our obedience to his word. We all um, do not long for him as we should. And we all allow ourselves to be satisfied by the things of this world more than being satisfied with him alone. But God is a God of second chances. It's amazing to me that the word of God even came to Nineveh, uh, even came to Jonah the second time. To know that, that God would even allow that to take place. That God did not cast Jonah aside because of his desire to simply flee. That God did not allow Jonah to remain in the fish or allow him to die in the sea. But God, in his work of grace, comes to Jonah and reveals his word and his call once again. And notice the command that he gives this time. It's similar, but it's different. Arise and go to Nineveh, that great city, and notice what he says, and call out against it the message that I tell you. Much more specific now. Whereas previously we're told, rise up and cry out against it, for their evil has risen up before me. Now God is saying, I want you to give the message that I'm going to give you. So you will speak my words. But what I don't want us to lose sight of here is that Jonah, in his running from God, and his half-hearted repentance, not fully dealing with the sins of his life, and his struggle with understanding God being a God of all the nations, keeping God for himself, struggling with a, a racist, struggling with an ethnocentric problem, yet in his moment of brokenness, in, in him being a wounded and yet broken vessel, God still uses him. Sinclair Ferguson says this, it was the restoration of Jonah which was the means of revival in Nineveh. You know, it's important for us to understand that. Paul says in 2 Corinthians that we have this treasure, how? We have this treasure in jars of clay to show the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. What is Paul saying there? He's talking about how we are but jars of clay, at times broken, certainly frail, but yet we hold a glorious truth, and that is the work 
of God and his work of grace. You know, the struggle for many of us is that it would be easy for us to say that God can use someone, but just not me. You know, sometimes we are more aware of our own failures. We see our own cracks within the clay pot. We see our own weaknesses instead of the glory and power and might of God. And this right here is a lesson that reminds us that it is not about us. We are but the vessel that carries the work of grace. How many of you realize today that all the great revivals that have happened within our world, all the great awakenings that we know of have taken place as God got a hold of but one person, uh, just one person. Think for a moment about the first great awakening we remember and we think about George Whitfield and Jonathan Edwards, but it had its beginning with a man by the name of Theodore Freiling, who's a, maybe I'll pronounce that right. He was a Dutch Reformed Church uh, minister in New Jersey who came to America and was shocked by the deadness of the church that he found. And so moved of his own life, of his sinfulness and need of God and seeing the need within the land, he constantly preached for conversion. He constantly preached the holiness and righteousness of God. And God used one man and spread an awakening. Think also of the second great awakening. We typically think of Charles Finney, yet it was on an American frontier, revival meeting somewhere around, they say, June 1800 with a Presbyterian minister by the name of James McCready, who just had a simple meeting in preaching again the holiness and righteousness of God, that people were awakened to their sinfulness, to their weakness in need of God, and God showed up, and a movement began. Jonah was but a broken vessel. Mark himself, Mark Zook, was just a broken vessel. We are all broken vessels. All of us are in need of improvement. But it's not us. It is the work of God. It is the word of God. It is his work of grace that brings transformation. And just as God used Jonah, broken as he was, wounded as he was, God can use you to bring a renewal in the lives of others. God's grace is carried by broken vessels. But also I want you to see that God's grace is received by simple faith. It is received by simple faith. Look with me again in the second part of verse 3. So after this word of God has come again to Jonah, the Bible says, Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three days journey in breadth. And Jonah going into the city, the Bible says, going a day's journey, and he called out. Yet 40 days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And then notice the first part of verse 5. And the people of Nineveh believed God. Nineveh is first mentioned in Genesis chapter 10, where we are told that Nimrod went forth in the land of Assyria, and he built Nineveh. It's not mentioned again until we come to the book here of Jonah, and we are learning about Nineveh. It was, as we said before, the capital city of Assyria. It was the largest and most affluent city of its day. And it is roughly um, in modern day Mosul, Iraq is where Nineveh was. And notice how the Bible describes Nineveh. The Bible says that it was an exceedingly great city. Historians tell us that uh, the, the city was roughly in the shape of a rectangle. 
and that it moved along the length, if you will, a portion of the length of the Tigris River. And some historians tell us that it went as far as 30 miles along the Tigris River, and then at times had a, had a breadth of about 10 miles. And so it was certainly a large city. Uh, it was known for its walls and gates. It had 15 gates. Historians tell us that some of those gates stretched up to about 100 feet in height. And very similar, as we have read about other cities of antiquity, uh, they would have uh, width to where you, know, you would have three chariots being able to drive across the top of it. Fifteen gates, as I mentioned, five of them still in existence, some of them, though, being destroyed with uh, ISIS and their uh, destruction as they were there in Mosul, Iraq. But if the Bible says it was an exceedingly great city, it could be simply because, again, of its size or of its importance. As some commentator says, it could also be simply because of God's love for it. God's love for it. Because there was something to where God says, Jonah, I wanted you to go. Certainly, as we know, the evil has risen up before God, but God wanted them to know him. And God, perhaps certainly had a great concern for the city. And it says it was a three days journey. That doesn't mean that it was three days to cross it in diameter. There's been a lot of uh, writing about this, of whether or not it was literally large enough that it took uh, Jonah to walk uh, three days from one edge to the other. Um, but the takeaway here is that it would take Jonah three days to move about the city and proclaim God, to proclaim who he is and the pending judgment that was coming upon Nineveh. And so certainly it was a three days journey, and yet his message, as we read here, was somewhat simplistic. Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Chances are there was probably more to the message. This is what the Spirit of God moving upon Jonah simply wrote for us. But certainly they came to know about God. And we know that because of the response of the people and the response of the king. But again, I call your attention to verse 5. The simple words, in light of Jonah's preaching, in light of Jonah just coming in in one day's journey and preaching the pending judgment, the Bible simply says, the people of Nineveh believed God. They believed God. And again, we, we don't want to get carried away and questioning whether or not this was a true and a genuine revival among the city. There, there are people who would say it was not simply because history doesn't teach us that. But what I want you to notice is that the Bible does not say that the people believed Jonah. The scripture says that they believed God. And not only does it say that they believed God, as we'll see in a moment, they, there was some outward manifestations of that belief. But what I want to call your attention to is the simple fact of faith. They simply believe. The message was proclaimed and the response of the Ninevites was that they believed. You know, sometimes we can make more of faith or more of belief than really what we need to. I remember a number of years ago, whenever I was speaking at a church in Tennessee, this was actually uh, what we called then a little small revival. We were going on about a week. In the very back of the church, I noticed that there was a man there. Every night he would come and he would sit there and he would listen intently. And at the end of every night, he would just get up and leave. But every night he would come back, same place, same demeanor, and almost, if you will, the same response, the same engagement to the message that I was preaching the very last night, he stayed and was the very last person to leave, and we sat and talked. 
His issue, as he began to describe it, was that in his mind, faith was too simplistic. That it, in his heart, in his mind, there had to be more for him to do to really receive the grace and the forgiveness of God. As he would say over and over again, Jeff, there has to be more to it. You may not just believe. And the simple truth is, yes, we believe. It is a work of grace that causes us to awaken to the knowledge of that truth. And the response to that knowledge of truth is that we simply believe it. We hold it as our etow, that this indeed is truth. The Bible tells us in John 1, verse 12, but to all who received him, speaking of Jesus, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. Our well-beloved passage, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Ephesians 2, Paul reminds us that we have been saved by grace through faith. It is the simplicity of faith. It is the mighty and the powerful work of grace that opens our eyes, removes the blinders that have been placed there, and grants us knowledge of the truth. But our response is simply to believe. And it's the simple response. Faith, in some sense, is complex. How do I grab hold of the work that Christ accomplished for me on the cross? How can the merit of Jesus dying for me and taking on the sins of the world that enables me to enter into the presence of God, how can I grab hold of that? How do I get that righteousness of Christ whereby I need to enter into his presence? When you think about that deeply, there is complexity there. But it doesn't take away from the simple response of believing. And I want to encourage you, if you're struggling with that simple response today, don't overanalyze it. Don't think too deeply about it. If there is a work of grace in your heart at this moment and you're saying this is true, I have fallen short of the glory of God. I am in need of a Savior. That is the work of God in your life, granting you that knowledge of the truth. And the simple response is to believe. We see God's grace is carried through broken vessels. And we see that God's grace is received by simple faith. And then lastly, as we close, God's grace is demonstrated by visual ways. It's demonstrated by visual ways. This is really the heart of our text, really from verse 4 and on, or verses 5 and on. We, we see the work of God and the response of the people of God there and the response of the Ninevites in particular. And this is the big emphasis as we see that that visual response. And you and I need to remind ourselves that anytime God shows up, anytime we are made aware of who we are in light of who God is, there ought to be and should be a change within us. That's what we see in the vision of Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 6, where he writes in the year that King Uzziah died, he saw the Lord sitting high upon the throne, high and lifted up. The robe filled the temple. And above him, the scripture says, were the seraphim, each with six wings, and two covered their face, and two covered his feet, and two he flew. And they called out to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. What was the response of Isaiah? Woe is me. Woe is me. For I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of people 
of unclean lips. When we come to understand who we are really in light of who God is, it ought to change us. There is nothing that we deserve but death and damnation and the wrath of God. Simply because God is righteous, God is holy, and just as light and darkness cannot coexist, sinful people in a righteous and a holy God cannot exist together. And when you and I come to understand the grace of God and what He has done for us and who we are in His presence, it ought to change us. I think there is a little bit of truth of those who say that we have become too comfortable with our sin today. Instead of turning from it, we entertain it. We play with it. And we lose sight of a holy and a righteous God. J.C. Ryle says this, True repentance is no light matter. It is through a change of heart about sin, a change showing itself in godly sorrow and humiliation, in heartfelt confession before the throne of grace, in a complete breaking off from sinful habits, in abiding hatred of all sin, Such repentance is the inseparable companion of saving faith in Christ. And we see this in the response of the Ninevites. We see it personally in the mourning, the sorrow that they display in sin. We see this in verse 6. Look at the text. The word reached the king of Nineveh. And he arose from his throne and removed his robe and covered himself with sackcloth and ashes. Sackcloth and ashes were used in the Old Testament times, and it was used as a symbol of mourning. It was used as a reminder to awaken the heart, to awaken the mind, and to remind them that something was not right. Uh, The sackcloth itself was a coarse material, usually made of goat's hair, making it very, very uncomfortable to wear. And ashes was just that, it was ashes. And just as you can imagine stepping in ashes, and the pain, the discomfort, and the whole purpose of putting on something that is uncomfortable, or sitting, or standing, And sometimes in the Old Testament times, they would put ashes upon their head. All that was a reminder to them that they fall short of the glory of God. It was a reminder to them of the weight and the truth and the heaviness of sin. And they are, in fact, mourning for sin. Let me ask you this morning, do you mourn for the sin that is present in your life? Do you understand its heaviness and its weight and are are so uh, loathing of it that it causes you to do whatever you can to be constantly reminded of it that you would mourn for the fact of sin in your life? That's what these people were doing. Not only were they mourning, they were fasting. In verses 7, in the first part of verse 8, And he issued, the king issued a proclamation and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles. Notice what he says. Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water. It's fasting. What a wonderful and a needed practice and discipline within the body of Christ today. The whole idea of doing without something so that you can focus your heart and your mind on something else. And what was it that they were to focus their heart and mind on? God. This was a turning to God. The mourning for their sin and the heaviness, the cost of that sin. But the fasting was to help them to turn to God. To focus on Him. To dwell upon him and then lastly we see the repenting the literal repenting in second part of verse 8 
Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. This is the turning from sin. So they're mourning that they have sin in their lives. They're focusing on God and fasting. Now they're literally turning from the specific sins in their life. Turning away from it. Certainly the one who has tasted the grace of God is no longer the same. And it's all for purpose. It's all for purpose that they may grab hold of God. John Ortberg says this, true repentance never leads to despair. It leads home. It leads to grace. Purposefully, they are hoping that God would change his mind. Notice in verse 9, who knows that God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. It's interesting here that in saying who knows that the king himself is hoping and pleading upon the mercy of God and doing whatever he can to turn toward God. Throw himself at the mercy of God. And yet the scripture tells us specifically in verse 10 that when God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said that he would bring, and he did not do it. Now that idea of God relenting has certainly caused a little bit of trouble for some within the church, but it's something that ought not to trouble us in any way. Many people look and they understand the idea of relenting is the idea of changing of mind, right? The Bible tells us that God does not change. So in what way is he changing here? Certainly, as we read in Malachi chapter 3, the scripture says, For I am the Lord, I do not change. Therefore, you are not consumed. Numbers 23, God is not a man that he should lie, nor son of man that he should repent. 1 Samuel 15, And also the strength of Israel will not lie nor relent, for he, speaking of God, is not a man that he should relent. So what does it mean here when we read that God relented of this calamity, that he relented of the disaster that he was going to bring to the people? Well, I think if you have the right context, it just simply makes sense. It's not as if God is changing his mind in the sense like you and I are changing our mind, you know? It's not like I go and I I go to the local ice cream place and I'm like, you know, give me some of that chocolate ice cream. And then I look at it and I'm like, ah, no, give me, I'd rather take the vanilla. That's not the relenting. That's not the changing of mind that the scriptures is talking about here with God. What we do know about God is he is holy and that he is righteous and that he is just and sin must be punished. Sin must be punished. Yet at the same time, God is gracious and God is merciful and willing to forgive the repentant. We see the two coming together in Jeremiah 18 where we read the instant I I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck them up or to pull them down, to destroy it. If that nation against whom I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster that I thought to bring upon it. God is not simply changing his mind like you and I might change his mind, but rather he is responding in accordance to his decreed will. And what is his decreed will? Is that if you and I come to that knowledge of the work of his grace and understand who he is as the holy and righteous God and where we fall short in his plan and in his need of him and turn to him in repentance and turn to him in the knowledge of the truth, he will have mercy upon us. And that is simply the work of God that we see here. The Ninevites turned, and God showed mercy. And praise God, it's the same thing that happens to us today. We are all under the wrath of God. We are all destined to destruction, to be separated from a loving and a holy God. 
Yet Jesus went and died upon the cross, taken our sins upon himself, taking the wrath of God on our behalf, that we may find forgiveness and be reconciled to the Father. And we go from being children of wrath to children of God. We go from being his enemies to his friends. And that is the work of grace. That is the work of grace. Etau. It is true. God did a work of grace within the Mook people. And he is continuing to do a work of grace in that people today. To where the people themselves have risen up. And every other tribe in Papua New Guinea who spoke their language have been evangelized. And even now, with Mark's children in there with the Mook people, they are being trained to understand the languages of other tribes in Papua New Guinea. That they too may go and carry the work of grace, the work of God, and what he has done. Let me say to you again, we are but just one movement of God, one movement from God, of this work to see a renewal, even in our own lives and even in our own land. But you know what it will take? It will take a broken vessel. Because God's work of grace is carried by broken vessels. My heart for you this morning is that you would see that God can use you, that you are that broken vessel and the work of God can come through you. But it will only come when we come to hate our sin and come to love God more. We dabble in it too much. We entertain it too much and we need to turn away. We have to be broken before we can be used. May God work mightily his work of grace in our lives and in our community because everybody outside the doors of this chapel need to hear the truth of God and his work of grace. The question this morning is that will you be that broken vessel and carry that message? Father, we look to you now and we ask God for your grace to be continually at work in us. Awaken us that we might understand our greatest need is of you and that we would yield afresh our lives to you and be your servants, be your instruments of righteousness for your glory and for your honor here. But once again, you would awaken people to the knowledge of the truth. We ask, oh God, that you would do this as we look to you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's please stand and sing our hymn of consecration. Oh Lord, thy touch hath served my soul. Join us again next week as we will see Jonah's response to the work of grace in the lives of the Ninevites and the lessons that you and I can gain from that. Will you join with me as we close in our benediction? Father, again, we pray your blessing to be upon all of us here today. Guide us, O Lord, as we leave this place and go back into the world of missions. Help us to be mindful of the call upon our lives and the mindful of the need in the lives of those that are around us, that we might bring your work of grace to those who are in need. We ask, O God, that you would do this for your glory and for your honor, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.